Good morning, Redwood Chapel. Am I invisible? Okay. Good morning, Redwood Chapel. Oh, that's, that's a little better. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Sharon Turney. I'm the director of the Community Worth Youth Worship here. That's the kiddos that sing and dance and do drama and stuff, and it's really fun. Anyway, um, I'd like to welcome you all and say uh, I just got back in from uh, Virginia yesterday, and boy, are my arms tired. That's a dad joke. You know a dad joke. Okay, that's a segue into Happy Father's Day, y'all. And happy Father's Day at home to my dad, Ron Rebuck. You're watching from Petaluma. Hi. Um, okay, so, oh, now is a good time to divert your attention from me because I'm weird. And look at your church center app. Uh, go ahead and check in there. You can register your attendance. Um, or you can also uh, use the little pew pocket card in front of you to uh, say stuff and encourage our pastoral staff because they're amazing. Um, also, you can give online with that Church Center app as well. So um, it's really important to remember to do that. We also have offering boxes in the lobby for that if you uh, so desire. Um, the annual business meeting will be next week, June 20th. Uh, somebody's excited about that. That's, that's Eric's department here. So, um, so yeah, that, that is the 26th. It's at 9.30 in the morning, and it preempts all uh, morning classes. So there will be no um, morning classes that day. Uh, summer electives, I should say. Um, okay, camp scholarships. If any of you grew up in the church and you, or you, you know, attended a summer camp, a church summer camp, you know what an amazing experience they are and what a life-changing experience they can be. They were for me, and I know a lot of people who, have, who can vouch for that. Um, there are scholarships that are needed and uh, desperately want to send these kids to experience God in that way. And so if you can um, possibly help, uh, the, they're headed to Dream Mountain Conference Center, uh, right outside Murphy's from June 26th through 30th. That's coming up really quick. Um, so if you guys can help, um, please contact Sherry Paranon to, uh, to help with scholarships for that. Uh, Night of Honor. Uh, you and I and everybody else has somehow been touched by a um, first responder. Um, so this is a night that we honor those people. That will be June, July 18th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. If you want to volunteer, you can also let us know on the virtual connect card on that app. See, that app is so versatile. Um, okay, so um, our missionary this week is not, in fact, actually a missionary, but it is a mission. We are having Life Summer Camp this week. Yay! Okay, yeah, you can, you can clap for that. It's going to be awesome. I'm helping direct it, so you really can clap for that because there's somebody really awesome. Um, but uh, so if you could uh, please pray for that. Um, there's a lot of volunteers, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff going on. You might have noticed the bathrooms have signs on them that say volunteer bathroom and some say camper bathroom. That does not pertain to you. So it, it does not mean if you see that bathroom, you have to move on and go find the one at the gas station down the street. It's okay. You can use those today. That's just for this coming week. So um, please keep in prayer all of the um, for health for everybody. We've already had some health issues that have been, you know, caused some teachers to have to kind of back off. Um, so uh, if you could pray for the children to understand the gospel message because they will learn about Jesus, and that's, you know, the most important thing they'll ever learn about. Uh, also, that they, will, they were given talents and gifts to use for the Lord, and all of us are given some kind of gift to use for the Lord and serve Him in our own special way. And so they need to learn that. Um, again, the health of the workers and the kids, and uh, the whole program just to run smoothly. Because this is the first time we've done it this way. There's four different tracks. It's almost like four different camps going on simultaneously. So it's got a lot of moving parts, but we are, we're praying and, and hoping that God will just bless the efforts of the, the staff and the volunteers for that. So would you pray with me? Father God, the mission field is not just overseas. It is right here in our midst. It is all around us. And our children are such a precious gift, Lord. I just pray right now that you will prepare the hearts of the children that are going to be here this week, that they will just soak in the knowledge that you love them so much, that you gifted them specially, that every single one of them is special and gifted to do good work that you have set up for them to do. 
Um, I just pray for health, for safety for everybody here, that no one will be injured, that everybody will just have a really good time, things will run smoothly, but mostly that your message will be heard and absorbed and will start to uh, bear fruit in the future of these children's lives. So I just thank you for everything that you're going to do this week. Uh, in Jesus' name, all God's children said, amen. amen. Take it away, Kevin. Hey, thanks, Sharon. Hey, listen, look, let's do first things first here, and because I, I heard a little cheering earlier on by Mr. Nuppy down here. How many of you are glad the Warriors won? <laughs> Nuppy's still going at it down here. <laughs> okay, that was my first question. Now, second question. How many of you are glad that Jesus defeated sin and death on the cross? Yeah. Amen. Yes, let's sing about that. Let's stand together.
Let's keep singing about that name of Jesus.
this morning. you are peace this morning it's it's not found in this world this world is a mess Lord we look forward to your return but until you come back you are our peace you settle our hearts no matter what's happening around us Lord we are so thankful to be your children through faith in Christ Jesus bless us God as we honor you the God of peace this morning and you rule in our hearts and we love you in the blessed name of Jesus 
Amen. You can be seated. Shall we pray? Lord God in heaven, we thank you again, echoing in the prayers of my brother Kevin for being in this place on this day at this time. We bless your name because of who you are and because of who we are becoming because of you. Now, Lord God, we ask that you would continue to dwell in our midst as we look into this, your word, your word is true, your word is accurate, your word is faithful, and it is our road map from earth to glory. Be pleased now to let your word flow unfettered and unhindered. May your word and your spirit meet meet each one of us where we are individually and collectively. May it speak to our individual situation. And may it encourage us and draw us closer to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Children, Miss Daly is there to my right waiting to receive you. So if you want to join her in Children's Church, feel free to do so. If you choose to stay here, feel free to do so. And parents, please remember to pick up your children <laughs> after worship. It's good to be with you today and to all of the fathers in the house, happy Father's Day. Amen. To all of the men in the house, happy Father's Day. And we encourage you to continue to fulfill your God-given, God-ordained role as leader in your family. Notwithstanding what our contemporary culture would say there is a place for fathers in the home. And as I study uh, sociology, it is clear that the absence of fathers in many of our homes is spilling over into many of the situations that we see in society. This morning, we introduce the topic of biblical stewardship. We continue our series in thinking biblically, and the question is asked, what is stewardship? You've probably heard about it. We've probably, if you've been to any, around any church for any length of time, you've probably heard it mentioned in one form or another. My role today is simply to introduce the topic. And in the coming weeks, uh, our pastors will be drilling down a little bit deeper in various areas of stewardship. But let me start off by saying stewardship is a recurrent theme within the Bible. Uh, the Bible is not silent when it comes to stewardship. As a matter of fact, perhaps the first biblical reference to stewardship is found in Genesis when Adam is tasked with naming all of the animals and keeping the garden uh, at the command and at, under the authority of Almighty God. But then there are some other um, references to stewardship, just very briefly, this is not on your slides, but uh, I think of Joseph being a steward. Uh, you recall how he was sold by his brothers into slavery and he ends up in an Egyptian jail. And the record says there that he was given charge over other prisoners in the jail. You see how he manages the jail. Then you see how he manages Potiphar's household. And then you see how he manages the affairs of the nation of Egypt. 
I think of Moses who uh, has the task of shepherding and stewarding a people out of Egyptian bondage through the wilderness and a particular element of his stewardship too that come to mind uh, when he is tasked with um, making the tabernacle God gives him a plan and he gives him instructions on how that is to be done perhaps the most striking example of stewardship out of Moses' life is when he has the visit from his father Jethro Moses is there hearing the people they're bringing their concerns to him and Jethro's father sees what's going on and his father tells him you know what you're doing is not good for yourself or for the people you're going to wear yourself out and you're going to wear the people out and, the, and you need to manage better what you're doing and so you know, the command is to uh, select able men out from among the tribes who can handle the lesser matters and uh, Moses you handle the more severe matters and perhaps the ultimate example of stewardship from biblical literature is found in Jesus we don't often think about that but in brooding over this topic uh, I was drawn to Jesus's Lord's Prayer high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 and Jesus starts that prayer off by saying father the hour has come glorify me and then later on he's a little bit later on he says I have finished the work that you have assigned or given me to do giving an account of his stewardship to the father just before he goes to the cross and then perhaps the ultimate example on Jesus's steward in the element of stewardship in Jesus ministry as I stand here and think is when he's on the cross and he makes the statement in his finish to tell us meaning that everything that I've come to do I have finished I have managed well and so stewardship is a recurring theme now Christian discipleship is inclusive of Christian stewardship you know we're becoming a, a disciple making church and we want to train and teach disciples and followers of Christ how to be a good steward and so they are interlinked to one another you cannot separate them and it's our responsibility to be able to teach and to train disciples of Christ how to manage well stewardship is managing well all of us in one form or another are a steward Again, this is not on the slide, but I think about if you are in um, a student pursuing an academic program or an academic degree. There's the stewardship of getting your classes, managing your caseload, getting your assignments in on time, interacting with your professors, knowing when to sleep, knowing how to eat, so forth and so on. You are just celebrating uh, the victory of the uh, San Francisco aka Golden State Warriors some of us are old enough to remember when they played in San Francisco at the San Francisco Civic Auditorium that is in the previous century um, <laughs> but you notice the NBA Finals and the playoffs and the entire season has an element of stewardship in it managing players watching film of your opponent discerning which players match up better in this particular series who is going to be at the low post who is going to be the strong forward the Warriors don't have a big man so you don't need to have to worry about a low post who's going to play defense who's going to be out on the wing on the fast break all the how do you manage time stewardship is seen in so many areas of our lives but in Christian stewardship, the disciple of Christ strives to bring all areas of his or her life under the Lordship of Christ. So now you think about all of your areas of life. All areas of life should be brought under the Lordship of Christ. And if you would bring up the next slide, uh, I believe there's one that has 
um, the areas of life on it. I want the, the audience and the congregation to see this. If you look on this slide, you will see how everything is pointing toward the cross, pointing toward the center. And you see the different areas of life, education, natural abilities, body, mind, business, entertainment, family, friends, and enemies, community, and politics, religious, and spiritual formation. Every one of those areas are pointing back toward the cross. Now here is where, even though we're talking about biblical stewardship primarily to those who are in Christ, here is where I make my appeal for those who are not in Christ because everything points back to the cross. And so for the one who is not in Christ, who has not placed his or her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, for you the first step is to acknowledge your need for Christ and inviting him to be your Savior and your Lord, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing him to reorient and recalibrate every area of your life so that the cross is seen touching every area of life, and every area of life is seen pointing back to the cross. Stewardship. It's not something that we do uh, on an island to ourselves. Between the spokes, look between the spokes, and you see these different areas. And this is not necessarily in all-inclusive, but it gives you an idea of the areas of our lives that the believer in Christ needs to bring into subjection of the Lordship of Christ. There are no areas of life where I say, okay, God, I have, for the sake of this discussion, eight areas of life, all right? And God, I'm going to let you in. Jesus, I'm going to surrender to you uh, six areas of my life, and the other two I'm going to keep to myself. That doesn't work when it comes to, to the lordship of Christ. He wants to be lord of all. Now, this is a growth process. I'm not saying this is going to occur overnight, but the ultimate goal in every area of my life Lordship of Christ. What does the Lordship of Christ have to say about this? What does my identity in Christ have to say about this? Is it in good alignment, or do I need to make some suggestions or, or some, some uh, corrections, or do I need to simply invite Jesus into that area of my life? One of the examples that I use in this context is, is having a house, 15-room house, and uh, there's that one room in the house. It's almost like, if you let me, as I stand here and think, it's almost like Mr. Whoopi's closet from Tennessee Tuxedo. <laughs> you youngsters are not going to understand this, but Tennessee Tuxedo was a cartoon character that we would watch. And when he got into trouble, he would go and see Mr. Whoopi. And Mr. Whoopi would go to his closet and pull out his three-dimensional blackboard. But when Mr. Whoopi went to the closet, the closet was so cluttered and unorganized that as soon as he opened the door, everything fell out of the closet because that area was not organized in Mr. Whoopi's life. Sometimes our lives, our areas of life are like that when it comes to Christ. We have so many areas that are well and pristine, and we invite Christ in, and we invite others in. And then there's this one area where we say, Jesus, just focus on this area. Don't, nothing to see here. Please move on. Nothing to see here. Just focus on this. That doesn't work when it comes to Christ. He wants to um, have lordship over all areas of life. Why? Because the Bible speaks to every area of life. The next slide that comes up, you'll see God in the center, and you'll see these different areas of life, and the Bible speaks, God speaks to every one of these areas, either in principle or command. And it's up to me, it's up to you, the child of God, 
to seek out and search what God has to say about the era, not what our culture has to say, not what the president or the governor or the mayor or the city council person or the librarian or the dog catcher has to say. What does God say about this area and how do I bring my life into alignment with what God has said? Okay, and so this is this area of stewardship. Now let's move on to our stewardship principles. Um, the first principle that I want to give you, I want to kind of use as a working definition of what stewardship is. And stewardship is the managing of our God-given resources according to our God-given abilities to achieve God-given results. I want to use that as a working definition. It's, it's listed as a principle, but I also want to use it as a working definition. Stewardship is the management of our God-given resources according to our God-given abilities, and I will add, in God-ordained ways to achieve God-ordained results. Amen. Okay, so you think about that as we move on. In Christian stewardship... Every Christian is to invest their lives and their God-given resources. Why? So that God gets the best return on his investment. When you hire a financial planner, when I hire a financial planner, my goal is to entrust this individual to help me manage my finances so that I get the best return over time. We're not talking about overnight but we're talking about over time. So over a lifetime, are you investing your God-given resources so that Almighty God gets the best return on his investment in us? His investment in us it starts with the Imago Day. He has stamped his image on us. We are created in his image. He has fearfully and wonderfully made us, Psalm 139. There is nothing in our lives of which he is not acquainted. But he didn't stop there. He sent his son to redeem us out of sin, the ultimate investment in our lives. And from grace to glory, from the cradle to the grave, from this side of the grave to the other side of the grave, our goal as Christian disciples ought to be living our lives so that God gets the best return turn on his investment in us, which is the shed blood of Jesus, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and his word that he gives us to live by. Amen. All right, so how are we doing? How are we doing? Now, think about this in stewardship. The next principle, God never requires from us that which he has not already given or provided to us. Follow it throughout Scripture. When God commands Israel in Leviticus to be ye holy as I am holy, he has given them the blueprint of what holiness looked like in that context. He never tells us to do without first providing. And so in biblical stewardship, one of the principles I think about how David uh, brings all of the resources for the temple that he wanted to build to God's glory. God told him, you're not going to build the temple because you are a man of war and you've shed it much blood, but your son is going to come behind you and build the temple. And in, 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 in Chronicles, it talks about how David offered the prayer and said, we are simply bringing back to you that which you have already given to us. And so God never requires from us unless he has first provided for us. And then... The next thing is this, God holds us accountable for the resources that he gives us. All of us are going to have to stand before God and give an account. Now, for the believer in Christ, it is an account of our stewardship since coming to Christ. It's not an account of whether I am saved or not. That issue is settled because Jesus died on the cross and I place my trust in him. So the issue of salvation is not on the table, but how have I lived, how have I managed my life since coming to Jesus? Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when he talks about building on the foundation, hay, wood, 
and stubble or gold, silver, and precious stone. And he said, what? Everyone's work will be tried in the fire, and you receive reward on that which remains. Amen. And so God holds us accountable for what he gives us. Now, for the sake of our discussion, our God-given resources includes our talents, and our talents include our natural abilities, our spiritual gifts, things that we do on a tangible level. When we hear of talents in the Bible, we're going to be looking at that text in just a few minutes, we tend to look at primarily from a financial standpoint. But let me read what J.C. Rao says about the, about the topic of stewardship. He says this, Anything whereby we may glorify God is a talent. Our gifts, our influence, our money, our knowledge, our health, our strength, our time, our senses, our reason, our intellect, our memory, our affections, our privileges as members of Christ's church, our advantages as possessors of the Bible, all our talents, all that we have has been loaned from God. We are his stewards. We are God's debtors. That's from uh, J.L. Riley. He's an um, Anglican theologian. So our, natural, our God-given resources includes our talents, our mind, and our body. How well are we managing our body, our temple? Are we taking good care of it? How well are we managing our time, our energy, our activities, our service? How well are we managing our treasure, our influence, our possession? And how well are we managing our testimony, our influence, our words, our actions? All of these want to be brought under the Lordship of Christ. And so as we introduce this topic of stewardship, don't just get locked in on finances. Stewardship is a holistic concept that touches every area of our lives. Now, notice the similarities between our God-given resources and our areas of life that we saw earlier. You saw the areas of life of politics, you saw family, you saw friends, you saw enemies, you saw all the, and then notice the, the resources. There is overlap there, and so all of these areas need to be brought into the, to the Lordship of Christ. Now, our God-given resources cannot be compartmentalized. If you see the next slide that comes up, you see the, the different areas and how they all intersect in this concept of stewardship. And so what we're trying to do is just present a more holistic approach on what stewardship is like. Now, let's go into the biblical text. Now, today, we're going old school. There will be no scripture text on the screen. You will have to open your Bible or your phone or your tablet. Today, we're going old school. I, like you, many of you in here, are old enough to remember when we did not have all of this technology. I am not knocking technology. I use it to its fullest potential. But today we're going to uh, um, go old school. Now, while you're finding the first scripture, which is in Luke chapter 10, I want to say this that hits us right here in the pew where we are today. I want you, as you sit in this building, to just look around and see what you see. Just, just take a look around and see. Look at the structure of this building. Now, I want to commend uh, Pastor Eric Younginger, who is our current uh, pastor of operations, director of operations, as he, in his current capacity, has been leading us to manage well the resources that we have here. Now, he didn't know I was going to do this, uh, so gotcha. Um, but, 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 but in a very real sense, this facility was made in the previous century. And look at how well it is maintained, how well it is utilized. Look at how we are striving to manage well the gifts and the offerings that you give to the Lord in this place. 
So you see, stewardship is something that we see every Sunday when we come here. We often overlook the, uh, uh, the uh, concept of stewardship, but when you see the monitor behind me, the monitors here, the instruments here, the lighting, the PA system, the people on the parking lot, the coffee that you have in life stage, everything that goes on here during the week, we're trying to manage well the resources that God has given us. And so it's, and so it's not just you know, what I'm doing in my life individually, but as I said earlier, stewardship touches many areas of our lives. And I wanted to make that point here because this is a tangible example. As you sit in a comfortably padded pew, this is part of our stewardship. As you sit in a facility that has air conditioned, this is part of our stewardship. I grew up in a church where we didn't have air conditioning. We had to open the windows and have a fan and fan all day to cool us down. But look at what we have, and God is good. He has blessed us, but we want to manage well. Amen. Okay? I got that out of my system, so now let's move on. <laughs> all right, now our first scripture reference is out of Luke chapter 10. And what I want to do with this scripture reference I want us to see, I want you to identify which attitude best represents you in the context of holistic stewardship. Talents, time, treasure, testimony, temple. Now the narrative is a very familiar narrative. It is the narrative of what we call the Good Samaritan. Now, the Bible text, Jesus didn't call it the Good Samaritan. That's what we editors and, you know, individuals have named it. In the context, Jesus has set his face, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, toward Jerusalem. So he's in the final phases of his ministry. And while he is um, near Jerusalem, he's in a setting where a lawyer asks a question in verse 25. The question that the lawyer says is, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The implication is that it is a formal teaching session because in the teaching sessions, if one had a question, they would stand up and address their question to the rabbi or the teacher. Jesus' response to him, he goes back to the word. Now, if you've been in spiritual warfare, you know what I'm going to say now, you know. It's the word of God, what? The word of God known, the word of God believed, the word of God obeyed, the word of God spoken that gives us a victory in spiritual warfare. And so what does Jesus do? When the lawyer asks a question, he points him back to the word of God, and he answers in verse 26, what is written in the law? He's referring to the Mosaic law. How does it read to you? The lawyer's response is, in essence, you shall love God in totality and your neighbor as yourself. And that's from uh, Leviticus that he's referring to and Deuteronomy. Okay? The lawyer's response in verse 28 is, uh, uh, correction, Jesus' response is, you've answered well, verse 28, do this and you will live. Referring back to, I believe it is Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 11, where the prophet says, For the one who does these things, obeying God, walking faithfully with God, he or she shall have life. Okay, so it's still in an Old Testament pre-Calvary context that we're talking about. Now, the lawyer poses another question in verse uh, 29. And he says, uh, Who is my neighbor willing to justify himself? Now, the concept of neighbor in Israel's culture was that it was started first with a fellow Israelite, but it was extended to any Gentile who chose to live among the Israelites and embrace the Israelites' God as their God, okay? So he asked the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus does not condemn him. Jesus tells him a story. Jesus was an amazing teacher. A lot of times when people would come and put questions to him, he would do teaching by object lesson. And so Jesus gives this narrative of a certain man who uh, was going down to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. If I remember correctly, 
uh, the Jericho Road was known as a dangerous road because a lot of times marauders and thieves hung out on the road to uh, get prey, kind of like what we see to get day happening a lot of times in our society. You're going around minding your own business and, and with snatch and grabs and everything else. They um, did the same thing in biblical times. And so Jesus says, as he went down, he fell among thieves and robbers, verse 30, who beat him up, stripped him, and left him half dead. And then he goes on and he says, by chance, a priest came by, verse 31. He was going down, and when he saw him, and the implication is this, he sees the man, he looks at the man, and then goes around the man. That's what the priest did. And in the attitude of the priest and the Levite, oh, let me back up. The attitude in the thieves are, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. They see the man, they beat up the man, and they leave him half dead. What's yours is mine, and, I, and we see this, let someone break in your car. What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. Let someone break in your house. What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. Do you have the same attitude when it comes to stewardship? What's yours is mine, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take all I get and get all I can. Is that your attitude? The second attitude is seen in the priest and the Levite. Coming down, they see him, and the book says that they cross over to the other side. Now, the priest and the Levite were members of the community who had the responsibility of caring for the lesser fortunate in the community, and yet they uh, passed by. Are they concerned about if we touch this man, we're going to be defiled, and we're going to have to go into quarantine ourselves? They don't know if he's alive or dead, but they do know if they touch a dead body, now they have to go in, into quarantine because now they become ceremonially unclean. And so their attitude is this. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. They didn't reach out to give a helping hand to the man down, but their attitude was, I'm too busy, I ain't got time, I'm on my way, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. Is your attitude towards stewardship the same way? It's my body, my house, I'm keeping it, and I ain't sharing it with nobody, and don't ask me to. The third attitude that is seen in the parable is with the Samaritan. He sees the man, he stops, he renders aid. The book says that he uh, soothes his wounds with oil and wine and then puts him on his beast, takes him into town, puts him up at the inn, puts a deposit down, tells the innkeeper, he says, now here's a deposit, this should cover it. When I pass back through, if there's any uh, outstanding bill or accounts receivable, I will settle the bill. What's mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. Which attitude best represents you when it comes to stewardship? What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. Or what mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. I'm going to share it with you. Those are three attitudes that we see coming out of the characters in the narrative of the Good Samaritan. Now, Jesus finishes the narrative by asking the man a question. He says, now, which of these three demonstrated to be a neighbor to the one who was in need? And the lawyer says, what? The one who showed compassion. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Now, this question that this lawyer asks is not the first. There, there's two other lawyers in biblical literature that ask the same question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Because in the Jewish mindset, inheriting eternal life was the extension of their days going on into the, into the time of, of when Israel would be reigning on earth. And so their concept of eternal life was different than our concept of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And yet the question is asked at least three times in Scripture by three different lawyers, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And each time, Jesus pointed them back to Scripture. So what's your attitude? What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. What's yours 
is mine and I'm going to take it. What's mine is yours and I'm going to give it. Now with that in mind, let's turn next to our uh, second passage, which is in Matthew chapter 25. And in Matthew chapter 25, now that we've looked at the attitude of stewardship, now we're going to revisit the principles of stewardship, the management of our God-given resources in God-ordained ways to achieve God-ordained results. Matthew chapter 25 is our next uh, biblical text. And in Matthew 25, this uh, narrative of Scripture uh, starts in chapter 24 with the question that Jesus, the disciples asked, when is the end coming? They asked that question in Matthew 24, verse 3. And Jesus' response was, take heed that no one deceives you. And from that portion on through the end of the 24th chapter, Jesus speaks of themes in eschatological terms. Okay? In Matthew 25, he talks about the illustration of the days of Noah, how everyone, or 24, how everyone will be giving and taking in marriage. Then in Matthew 25, he starts off with the, uh, with the parable of the uh, ten virgins. We're going to spend our time looking at from verse 14 through 30, the parable of the talents. Now, this literary context is on the Mount of Olives, and Jesus is speaking uh, to his disciples. There are some, there are some similarities in each one of these parables that Jesus gives in Matthew 25. One is, is that the Lord is going to return. Another theme is that the Lord holds people accountable when he returns. And he holds them accountable for the resources. And so Jesus says in the 14th uh, verse of chapter 25, he says, well, it is like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted them with his possessions. Verse 15, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own abilities, and he went on his journey. Okay? Now the talent was more, is, is, is not talent, we don't use the term, correction, the Bible doesn't use the term talent as we use it. In our culture, when you hear the word talent, we think of a skill set or a person that's something that's really gifted, and it includes it. But the Bible's definition is a little bit broader than that. The biblical definition of talent was a weight, a certain amount of weight, usually, if I remember correctly, between 58 and 80 pounds. And it could be a weight of gold, silver or bronze, and whichever the coin was determined its value. In the biblical text in verse 18, verse 18 gives us an insight because at the end of verse 18 it talks about the term money is there, and that term in the Greek is the same term for silver. So we can conclude from the biblical text that the owner or the man, or, or yeah, the owner gave his, sermon, his uh, servants X amount of silver talents to invest while he was gone. To one he gave five, to one he gave two, and to one he gave one. And what's interesting, the text says, he gave each according to his own abilities. Let me pause and say this right here, that God gives us our talents, God gives us our abilities, knowing how they will work for us, okay? And so it's no need for me to be jealous of any of someone else's talents. My job is to use the talents that God has given me, the resources that God has given me to his glory. The late Dr. Caesar Clark, who used to pass a Good Street Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, put it like this. He used to say this, if God has made someone a juicy peach, if God has made someone a juicy orange and made you a lemon, don't be envious and jealous of the juicy peach or, or, or envious and jealous of the juicy orange. Just be the best lemon you can be and God will give somebody the taste for lemonade. So the idea is, is, to, is to bloom where you have been planted. And so the concept here in the biblical text is what? That the owner knew his servants. 
He knew what they were capable of. He knew their temperament and their skill set, and he gave them talents based on what he knew to be true about their skill set. And so you don't have to be jealous about anybody else. How has God created you? Back to Psalm 139. Everything about me, Lord, you know. All of my ways are open before you. Lord, you have made me put your name there fearfully and wonderfully, and my soul knows it right well. So, Lord, help me to live up to the potential that as you have created me. You don't have to be jealous. You can admire the person. You can applaud the person. You can esteem the person, but you don't have to be jealous of them. And so the text says that he gave each according to their own ability. While he was away, the one that had five invested and did well. The one that had two invested and did well. The one that had one did not do as well as the one that had two and the one that had five. Eventually, the owner comes back and does what? He calls them into account. And the one who had five, he comes rejoicing. And he says there in verse number 20, and the one who had received five talents came up and brought five more, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See how I have gained five more talents. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you charge in many things. Enter into the joy of your master. You did well. You managed well. You stewardshiped well. I knew you could do it, and now as a result of what you have done, you're now going to be elevated up a little bit. Same is true in verse 21 for the one that had, uh, correction, verse 22, for the one that had two talents. He says, Master, you gave me two talents, and I have gained two more. You can just see the joy in their heart, hear the joy in their heart as they come before their master, give an account, and say, you gave this to me. Look what I was able to do with what you gave me. See, it's all right here. Count it, count it, count it. Look how well I was able to manage your resources. Don't all of us want to stand before God like that? God, you entrusted me with this. God, you entrusted me with that. Jesus, look how well I did with what you entrusted me with. That should be our ultimate goal. Not so much to get accolades from people down here. Some of the people patting on your back are trying to knock you down, so you got to be careful of that. Your ultimate goal is to see, hear him say, well done. Okay? And so now let's look at the third one. Verse 24, and the one who received one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you had, no, where you had scattered no seed. I was afraid, and I went away, hid your talent in the ground. See, here it is. You can have it back. That's my translation. That's not uh, in New American Standard. Look at the attitude of that servant. Accusations against his master. And then look at the response of the master. You wicked, lazy slave. Is that something that we want to hear Jesus say to us when we stand before him? You wicked, lazy slave. Here's your talent back. Let me at liberal. I didn't ask for it in the first place. And you knew my temperament. You knew about me. So here, just take it back, and we can go our separate ways. What kind of attitude do we have? Now, in this, in this, in this passage, we revisit our principles of stewardship. What were those principles? The management of our God-given resources according to our God-given abilities 
to achieve God-ordained results. Two of the people in the parable did just that. They took what their master gave them, they managed it well according to their abilities as he had given to them, and they achieved God-ordained results. Okay? They, they, they utilized their natural talents and their abilities to do what they needed to do. They also uh, invested their resources to bring the best return on their master's investment in them. So how well are you, how well am I living my life with the intent that when I stand before God, maybe it's a hundredfold, maybe it's thirtyfold, maybe it's fortyfold, but it should be more than onefold when I stand before him. In the narrative, God holds us accountable of our resources that he has entrusted to us and God always provides for us before he required of us. In the, in, the ter in the narrative, the owner did what? He provided for the stewards before he required anything of stewardship or accountability, okay? And he held each of them accountable. Those that, the two that did well, they were rewarded. The one that did poorly was held accountable for his actions. So in this area of stewardship, it's, more, it's holistic. It's not just one area. Now for application and observation. Here are some questions for you. Are you an owner or are you a manager? How do you see your role in stewardship. A steward is a manager. Are you an owner or are you a manager? Are you a reservoir or are you a river? What is your attitude? Are you a dam or are you a channel? Do you get all you can and can all you get? What's your attitude? As the late um, old man Oldstein used to say, my name is Jimmy and I'll take all you give me in, in, the, in the context of stewardship. Is that my attitude also? And then lastly, which best represents you? My God-given resources control me. Maybe they do. Or, I control my God-given resources, I make them work for me, and sometimes I let God participate. Which one represents you? And then the last one, God controls me, God guides me in the use of the resources that he has provided. You will have to discern which attitude best represents you. You'll have to discern, discern how you identify with the thieves, the priest and the Levite, or the Samaritan. You'll have to discern which servant you identify with, the one that had five, the one that had two, or the one that had one. You'll have to discern, are you a reservoir or a river? You'll have to discern, are you a dam or a channel? You'll have to discern, do you get all you can and can all you get? You'll have to discern that my, are, my, are my resources, my time, my talent, my treasure, my temple, are they controlling me? Do I let God participate? Is it my body and I'm going to do what I want to do with it and I don't care what you say, God? Or, God, you have given me this body to live between grace and glory. How am I going to manage it? Because everything that we have, all of our resources, it starts with God. We, we don't have the ability to do anything. My, you know, my uh, uh, aunt used to say, I'm, I'm keeping G-rated because I'm on, on camera. Um, 
My aunt used to say, you don't have a pot or a window. And some of us are old enough to know what that statement means. And sometime when we come to God, we come with the same attitude as if we own the pot and the window, when the reality is we don't own anything. And so how well? What's your attitude? And again, if you've never accepted Christ, it starts with the diagram that we saw with the cross. That's where it all starts. You can either bow the knee for the cross now in submission, joy, and redemption, or you will surely bow it later because the book says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all to the glory of the Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to look into your word and introduce this topic of stewardship. We thank you that you are a giving, gracious God. And the ultimate example of your giving is your son, our elder brother, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you have done in him for us. Father, as we look at this topic of stewardship, would you show us where we stand in the equation? Show us what needs to be recalibrated. Show us what needs to be adjusted. In the areas in which we are doing well, God, encourage our hearts. In the areas where we are doing poorly, rebuke us and correct us. And may we stand before you as those servants, the one who had five and the one who had two, stand before you and say, Jesus, look at how well we've invested our lives for you. And may we hear him say, well done good and faithful servants. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We turn our attention now to the Lord's Supper. And if you did not get a, a packet when you came in such as this, our uh, servers are coming now. You can raise your hand if you did not pick up uh, the Lord's Supper packet. Why do we do this? We do this, first of all, because Jesus invites us to remember. On the night that he was betrayed in the gospel narrative, Jesus tells his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of what? In remembrance that I am about to give my life, my body is about to be broken, my blood is about to be shed, and the redemption of mankind is about to be settled. Do this in remembrance of me. Further down the road, Paul addresses the same issue. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had blessed it, he broke it, and he gave thanks, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he goes down a little bit further, and he says, For as often as you drink this bread, or eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. I said this in the life stage class. I'm going to say it again here too. Every time we partake, we look back to what Jesus has already done. He has died on Calvary. We look forward to his coming, but we also proclaim to ourselves and the unseen world, Jesus Christ died for me. I am his blood-bought child, and I am not ashamed of it. And I eat and I drink in glory and thanksgiving to him. And that is why we partake of the Lord's Supper, partake in faith, partake in contemplation. If there is an unsettled issue in your life, get that issue straight before you partake, and then partake in joy for the redemptive work of what Jesus has done on our behalf. Be blessed as you partake, as we listen to the Madrids in this uh, communion selection. I know you now if you walked into the room 
If you still the crowd, if your light displayed the gloom, and if I saw your wounds, touched your thorn pierced brow, I wondered if I'd know. If you walked into this place, would I cause you shame? Would my games be your disgrace? Or would I worship you? Fall upon my face. I wonder if I'd know. I've painted so distorted who you are that even if the world was looking, they could not see you, the real you. Have I changed the true reflection to fulfill my own design, making it what I want, not showing you forth divine? the door would my flesh cry out I don't need you anymore or would I follow you could I be As I've said before, maybe it's an angel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As we uh, draw our service to a close, we are fortunate to have some new members this morning, and so we're going to put those names up on the screen. And as I read your name, if you would stand and uh, receive the welcome, Brenda Dyer, Dave Statz, Eric Townsend, Jeannie O'Brien, Judy, Judy Teller, Kyla Daly, Nellie Madrid, Todd Tyler, Don Chin, Paul Swamidas, Valerie Ortiz, Caleb Daly, Denise Barubi, Greg uh, Totten, Joy Barubi, Caress Batowski, Mimi Totten, Peter Latona, Vern Tyler, Mona Chin, and Nimi Swamidas, are you here? Let's welcome them, Redwood Chapel, to the family. And I would ask that as, you, as they are clapping, if you would go out into the lobby, and we will be welcoming you, Redwood Chapel style, following uh, the service. Redwood Chapel, stop by, shake hands, welcome them to the family, our fellowship is growing, and they have chosen to unite with us in membership. So we welcome you so you can go out now. Um, the Pew Crew, we have the Pew Crew here, and I would encourage you as you go out to please take your communion uh, receptacle with you and dispose of it outside in the lobby. And then lastly, visitors, if you are uh, here for the first time, we thank you for 
being here with us. We invite you to step by or stop by the welcome booth to receive a gift, just a little gift to say we appreciate you being here and we hope that you will return again. Now let us uh, stand and receive the benediction. And now the grace of God, our Father, the fellowship of the Son, the sweet and abiding communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and be with you all till we meet again. Amen. Be blessed. Amen.